Agile for Humans is brought to you by Audible.com. Get one free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player, including Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time by Jeff Sutherland, and Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson. Visit www.audibletrial.com forward slash agile to enjoy your free audiobook today. Processes and tools dominate today's agile discussions. But we are devoted to the individuals and interactions that make it work. From the beginner to the veteran practitioner, we have something for you. Welcome to Agile for Humans. Well, all right. Welcome to this week's episode of Agile for Humans. I'm your host, Ryan Ripley. Joining me today, one of my favorite authors, Esther Derby. Esther, how are you? I'm having a technology challenge day, but other than that, I'm great. Great. It's great to have you back on the podcast. Yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. She's brought along a a friend of hers and someone that I've been really interested in talking to, Stacy Johnson. Stacy, how are you? I'm doing great. So Stacy is an is an HR professional. She understands the the black art of human resource <laughs> management, something that, you know, even in, in my role as, a, as a, a manager of people, certainly interact with HR, but I don't always understand it. And that's not a bad thing. That's not a slight. That's just, it's a very complicated field and, and one that, that I hope Stacy is going to shed a little bit of light on and help us get an understanding of it. So Stacy, thank you for joining us as well. Thank you for having me. And I think part of that confusion really starts off with a lot of the common myths and mis misconceptions uh, about performance management. You know, the old, uh, the performance review is probably the, the number one topic of performance management, but there's so much more to it. So, so Stacy, I'm wondering if you could help us out with what are some of the common things that you see as far as the myths and misconceptions that perhaps don't add well to the, to the resource management conversation? I, I think there's a lack of understanding of the entire cycle that starts with your recruiting and you're hiring the right people that are a good fit for the job and a good fit for your mission and your vision and your values at your organization. And then performance management has, in some organizations, it's a dreaded topic. It's like the most dreaded conversation that employees have and managers have all year. <laughs> and I think that that, that just creates a, a really problematic environment where the only time employees are getting feedback on their performance is at the end of the year or at their formal performance feedback time. And that that's that just creates a big gap. It, it needs to be a, a much more robust and ongoing conversation. But I think the way that it's handled oftentimes is it, it, it just doesn't have very much impact, unfortunately. I would, I would say that it actually does have a big impact but it's not the impact people hope it will have. There you go. Right. I mean, I think people um, hope that it will improve performance, but when people are getting feedback only from the top down and only very infrequently, I think what it, the effect it has is it creates cynicism and erodes trust. Exactly. Well stated. Well, and I think the interesting part there, too, that, that Stacey, you, you might have started on, is that this is a cycle. And I've never actually viewed it as that before. I've always seen it as individual events that just kind of happen, right? So we hire somebody, we onboard them. They might get a, a few days of training around corporate history and culture if they're lucky. Correct. And, and then they're thrown into the, the fire of, you know, here, now you need to be productive. And we may, ne- and we may or may not define that for them. Exactly. You know, and then at the end of the year, we'll, we'll ask them how they think they did. And then we'll sit them down and give them the right answer. Exactly. That just sounds painful when you describe it, it that way. It does, doesn't it? But, um, but there actually is a cycle there. And I'm wondering if, in your experience, is that a, a cycle that's actually managed within the HR department? Is that something that from, from step to step that's, that you can see like there's a flow and a person's progress is, is visually available, or is it more of a, an independent kind of step or sequence that I laid out? I think it needs to be both. I think that HR needs to work with each department and each team and, and 
making sure that that is a, a flow, that the information flows and that managers have the training that they need to do a good job with developing all of their teams and that, that, that there is a really strong relationship with HR and that it's a, a really positive relationship. That's where I think it needs to be. I, I think you hit on something really important, Stacy. is that the managers have the skills to do it. Because I, I had a conversation with an HR person, not you, obviously, but with an HR person a, a while back who said, well, we have to do annual reviews because that forces managers to give feedback at least once a year. It, therein lies the problem, right? If managers don't know how to talk directly to, to people or just set expectations or to um, build feedback into the work so that feedback isn't just coming from their manager. Um, that's really the issue, I think. Yeah, I agree. As a manager myself, I, I certainly have to go through an annual performance review process. And that's part of the, that's part of the gig. What I've never really understood though, you know, what are the actual legal requirements of performance assessments, what do we actually have to do versus what perhaps some some common but not necessarily needed practices are? You know, Stacy, is there there's some insight there that you can give us around what we're actually obligated to do from a legal uh, perspective? That's a really good question, and often confused by many organizations and managers. Performance reviews aren't a legal requirement. However, most organizations need some way to evaluate the performance of the individuals in their organization. So that's where the annual review comes into play. And then if it's, like Esther was mentioning, if it's not done in a real, uh, in a good fashion, then it, it does build a lot of distrust and it can be more harmful than it is good from a couple of different perspectives. So if you have a manager who's not very comfortable giving ongoing feedback in a constructive way and they wait until the end of the year to give that feedback or they don't do it at all. They fill out on the performance review like everyone's fine and they don't note any real issues. Then if there, there is ever an, a decision perhaps to terminate that employee and they get challenged on that, then if you look back at the performance reviews, there's no documentation of the actual issues involved. And so from that, there's creating some liability for that manager in the organization by having this performance review process that isn't accurate and doesn't accurately align with the performance of individuals on the team. So there's many ways you can get into trouble with having those kind of ineffective performance reviews. So actually providing training to your management and having them understand the value of frequent feedback, but honest documentation of that feedback is actually a pretty good risk mitigation strategy. Exactly. It, if it's done consistently, because right. um, what, what, what I, when I was a manager, what used to happen was that, you know, everything was pretty much done on an annual basis unless there was someone who, for some reason, was an exception case, right? And they weren't doing their job appropriately in someone's point of view, at least. There's a point I want to come back to in a little bit about that. But then, then we were advised to start doing very detailed uh, documentation on that individual. But that also creates a liability if the employee is terminated because they can go to court and say it was harassment. They were not doing this to anybody else. I was the only one that was getting these detailed documents every week about what I was doing wrong. So obviously there was some discrimination there. And they so, could allege it was based on their protected class and not at, at all on their performance. And or they just, were targeted. You know, they, they were targeted in some way. Which brings me to the other point that I, I think is often left out of the whole discussion about performance review, which is that Kurt Lewin found a nice, succinct way to, to state this many years ago. He said that behavior or performance is a function of the person and the environment. And most performance reviews focus only on the person. They don't look at all about the environment in which this person was supposed to be doing their work. If the environment isn't conducive to the person actually being successful and the person is being evaluated without the context of that environment, it can often feel very, very unfair. That's true. Because the yeah. individual may not have the tools that they need right. to 
to be successful, but if that isn't a part of the conversation, right. that, that's a big gap. And then when people feel that it's unfair, that's when they're more likely to go to court. There's some, there's a bunch of research about related to physicians who have suboptimal outcomes. But when there's a there's an issue with a surgery or a birth or any sort of situation, they have found that the doctors who empathize and listen don't get hauled into court. And the doctors who stonewall and say, you know, well, it wasn't my fault, do get hauled into court. And I think there's a really interesting parallel with situations that involve performance and HR. It's like when people feel listened to and they feel that the process was fair, they recognize that, oh yeah, I'm really not cut out for this job often. But when they feel like they haven't been listened to, that's when things tend to get ugly. When it feels like it's uh, all a one-way process where they are being evaluated without reference to their environment and without a chance to tell their story that's when things tend to get really ugly in my experience. Does that match your experience, Stacey? Yes, it does. I agree with you. A few takeaways from there. I think, first of all, deep down, we all want to be treated fairly. Yeah. And when we're not, you'll see some of these very emotional and perhaps, you know, justified responses to not being Mm -hmm. treated fairly. Uh, The other one is the system is important. And so we all operate within systems of work. We are all subject to systems Mm -hmm. of work. And some of them are not the best thought out as they could possibly be. And in many cases, I think it's Deming who says that uh, people don't fail, the system does. And, and so I think that's important. Something that I've always, that's always felt counterintuitive to me, especially from an Agile context, because this, I guess this is an Agile podcast, yeah. right? So, yeah. so we should bring Agile yeah. into it a little bit, is that we review people on an individual basis, but we are expecting them to be self-organizing teams. And so at a team level where we have this this very grand expectation that they're going to forego their own personal motives and, and do what's best for the team as a unit, yet at the end of the year, their performance, uh, perhaps their compensation, mm-hmm. and even their future, uh, their future progression and path is all determined at an individual level. And that's always seemed a little counter to me. I'm curious if you've seen instances where that type of uh, performance assessment has actually hindered agile projects and implementations. Yes. (laughs) Okay, good. Let's move on. (laughs) Well, I I mean, I've had lots of conversations with people where, you know, they, they note the irony of that. And when it gets to review time, people start behaving differently, particularly if they want to get a promotion. And I've actually had people say to that, oh, yeah, he was great to work with. But he's up for a promotion now, so he's just going to be a jerk for a while so that he can get his performance marked in a way that will get him the promotion. And then he'll be back to being normal. So, yeah, that drives a lot of a lot of dysfunction. And I've actually, I mean, in, in my experience, if a team is working well, it's very, very difficult to actually ascertain to any degree of accuracy the individual contribution to success, unless someone's an exception. But that's that's a tough one to fit into the mindset of traditional performance evaluation, which is all individually focused. So, Stacy, when we have a team that's operating uh, at a high level, like what Esther described, and where it's almost indistinguishable who the high performer is, who the low performer is, where where the outcomes are truly valued over the output, how do you still have a process at an HR level that, that fulfills the needs of the organization, such as you know, mitigating the risk of lawsuit and and, and those kind of things, and, and still treat people fairly. How is that achieved? That's a really good question, and I know that teams struggle with that. If you have a high-performing team in it, or a team that's not performing, with their ability to give each other constructive feedback on a timely basis, can it can be an issue. Oftentimes, people aren't comfortable with conflict, and so if there is conflict within the team, they don't have that ability to to talk about it in a in a constructive manner and and move them along so that they can get through any issues so that they can stay at a high performing level i i think that's one area where oftentimes managers get pulled in to micromanage some chaos within the team whereas the team should be building those skills so that they have the comfort and the ability to do that themselves And then linking that into the group performance and group goals, I think that's a really important job for the manager to be able to have that picture of the team to make sure that each person is operating 
and really working together as a team so that you're not discouraging team members by letting someone get, you know, letting someone slide. The manager is a really important linking pin in that conversation to be able to use that group performance and then tie it back into the individual in whatever format is set up with that organization to do that, whatever formal performance review, what that looks like within that organization, and then how that ties into their compensation. So building on that idea of letting people slide, I think that's one of the real fears that managers have about Agile, is that if we're in a team environment, people will be allowed to slide. And so that's one of the reasons I think people really hold on Mm -hmm. so tightly to the whole individual performance evaluation Mm -hmm. thing, because they have this big fear Mm -hmm. that the slackers will be able to hide. And it's, it's an interesting dynamic about how do you help teams develop the ability to um, have conversations with their peers when for years, feedback has been solely the job of the managers. Right. I, I visited a team oh, many years ago at this point where the managers, they, had, they were trying to do Agile and the managers had said, oh, you're self-organizing now. You take care of everything. And there was one guy who was just telling other people what to do and you know, bossing other people around. He told one woman he, she, had, she had been to the dentist and, and had a bunch of Novocaine. So he said, oh, I guess I can slap you in the face today and you won't feel it. And, I mean, he was just on many levels being disruptive, you know, and he wouldn't, wouldn't um, let other people know what he was working on and so forth. And they went to their manager and said, you know, we've tried everything. We've talked to him. Our scrum master has talked to him. And he's still acting this way. And their manager said, you're self-organizing, you take care of it. And they didn't have the skills, right? And they had done everything they knew how to do. And then when they brought it to their manager, their manager abdicated, which was truly, truly unfortunate. That is unfortunate because sometimes it's the manager that has the, I don't want to say power, but ultimately they have the responsibility to, to do something about it. Whereas if your team is being... It, trying to effectively have those conversations, but the conversations are going nowhere, then ultimately it's the manager that's yeah. that's going to get involved. You know, I think it does take a very progressive stance to, to enable a lot of these systems, though. And, yeah. and what I mean there, you know, allowing a 360 review process, for example, is very, it doesn't feel safe to a lot of management because a lot of conflict will come out and there will be old grudges surfacing from working in traditional ways for so many years and all of these things coming together, it could be volatile, but we have to learn how to get through that mm-hmm. if we're going to be a self-organizing team, right? Well, I can, I can tell you one way not to do it. This is another <laughs> thing that I have seen, which is one, the, the manager set up a mandatory feedback circle where the team had to sit in a room and each person um, would ta- have their turn in the, I think they actually called it the hot seat. And all the other team members had to offer three pieces of praise and three pieces of criticism. I, I think a key tenant of, of what we do, whether you're in, a, in an agile space or not, is that such things should be voluntary. Well, uh, yeah. And I can't really imagine, uh, if I thought about it for a week, I don't think I could come up with as good a way to break a team. Yeah. As, as doing that. When there's an issue, it's best to talk about it directly and respectfully, but that does take skills. It does. And I, and I think the part that, from a management perspective, you know, Esther, you noted that managers worry that people will be able to slack. Mm-hmm. And, and I've seen that pattern as well in the, in the projects and transformations that I've worked on. But what the truth is, is there is no place to hide right. on an agile team. Right. It, is, it is very right. much apparent, almost from the from the start, who's doing what, how they're working together, and what the, what the outcome is. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and that's also a terrifying thought, I think, to a lot of people and even the managers on a team who, you know, in a, in a waterfall traditional organization, a lot of dysfunction can get pushed down into status reports and mm-hmm. Gantt charts, and, and that goes away. When you make these things visible, I think back to Stacy's point, this is when you need an incredibly strong partnership with HR. This is probably when you need them the most, when these things are surfacing and you need to work through them in an effective way. But I'm still stuck at a part, and maybe this isn't, maybe this is so context dependent that, uh, that it's not, you know, there's not one right answer to it. But as a manager 
with a team of over an agile team, you know, I get through, I, I totally agree that throughout the year we're in a constant feedback loop situation as a manager, you know, I set the rails um, and provide some boundaries and I push those boundaries here and there to try to get the outcomes that we need. But for the most part, the teams are self-organizing, you know, we step in when uh, they are completely stumped. But still, we're asking questions and coaching, not just fixing. You know, right. it's, it's that right. kind of management. It's, it's that servant it's, servant leadership management that, that I think is effective. But at some point, I'm going to be asked, how much should we pay this person on the team uh, at the hiring point? And then I'm going to be asked in later years, well, what should their increase be? And what kind of bonus do we pay? And what kind of stock options do they get? And I've always struggled with a model that actually treats people, back to, to Esther's point earlier, in the fairest way possible. And so have you seen models where companies have come up with, whether it's the team has a pool of money they allocate themselves, where I know that that experiment has been tried with mixed results. Mm -hmm. um, I've also seen where management just flatten it out. They say we have fifty thousand dollars to spread evenly across the team, or we have you know X percent that everyone will get on an annual basis as a cost of living increase, and move on. Have you seen any that have been exceptionally effective when working with an agile team from an HR perspective, or any team really? Any team, absolutely. Yeah. I think the there is the challenge that how do you keep the team working effectively as a team and not create this competition within your team, if you say you have an, a pot of money and how does that get distributed? Well, instead of creating more teamwork and creating a high functioning team, you can create a lot of internal competition. And so oftentimes that hasn't been successful if it is set up in that way of being competition. And, you know, if I, if I'm doing well, I might get a bigger chunk of the pie. So being able to analyze your team goals and, and compare how effective and functional your teams are across your organization, then I think that, again, is going to bubble up to your managers at some point to, to identify the higher functioning teams and then reward the, the completion of goals. Or it's a really, it's a quandary. It's a great question. I don't know who the high performers are anymore because I'm not guiding day-to-day -day ac day -day activity. I'm assessing outcomes. And so I know that the team as a whole is either meeting the outcome ob objective or not, but at the output, task, story, epic, however mm -hmm. you want to slice it, that level, who am I to say is the rock star or the, or the, or the underperformer? Well, I, I think you just touched on another one of the myths, Ryan, which is that managers ever could reliably identify who the high performers were. Absolutely. And that's that's actually one of the biggest myths about um, performance management. It has a lot to do with how, I mean, the, the cognitive biases and the biases around this are pretty well documented, that it may be about who is best at communicating to their manager. It may be who the manager feels the most personal affinity for. There are all sorts of things that get in the way of actually being able to reliably assess who are the high performers. And it can be that, you know, people who are quietly going about doing their work are actually making huge contributions, but the people who are maybe not doing so much work but are really good at presenting themselves look better from the outside. So I, I think that's actually one of the really important myths uh, around performance reviews. That's a hot topic in the HR world right now. There's been a lot of conversations about, you know, how do we improve performance management? And some companies are taking a look at that and looking at their traditional systems. For example, I saw a study where 58% of their supervisors thought that their performance management system wasn't effective and didn't drive performance. The conversation now is, well, what are we going to do about it? And how do we do something different when it's so hard to enact change in some organizations to move their performance management into a more of a constructive realm where you can, where it is dependent on those teams functioning and you and those the high functioning teams do stand out and that work is rewarded. And I, I even question the ability to say who the high performing teams mm -hmm. are. 
comparing across an organization. Because I have seen teams that were working on um, a relatively new code base do very, very well. And a team that was working with, you know, according to some definition of really, really well, um, a team that was working with older legacy code that had a lot of technical debt issues appeared to be very unproductive Mm -hmm. because their code was so fragile, right? So they had to be really careful and they couldn't move fast and they didn't get a lot done. So looking at those two teams against each other, one might look better, but were they? Context matters. Context really, really matters. Yeah, it really does. And since it is so contextual, I, I, you know, maybe I, I, I'm, I'm very rooted in Scrum, and, and I am a believer in, in that framework. And I, and one of the mantras of a Scrum master, is ask the team. Mm-hmm. And so I'm wondering if we can sit down with the team, and bring a an HR um, expert like Stacy to a to a retrospective perhaps, and say, look, here's how we're working today. How would you like to be compensated? And how would you like to be assessed? And how would you like to have these uh, performance management things go? What do you need? Is that kind of conversation possible uh, in today's you know, HR and legal environment? I think it's, it's more possible than it has been in the past because of the trend towards trying to improve performance management. And everyone or a lot of organizations realizing that they're, what they're doing now doesn't work. And I think that's a perfect way to suss out what does work is by talking to the teams. <laughs> and it seems so logical, but sometimes it's the last step that we take is to ask, like, well, what do you think? How would you like to, what seems fair? Like, why not start with that? That's brilliant, Ryan. No, I'm just stealing from work that, uh, that Esther and, <laughs> and Schwaber and many others did. Uh, getting Scrum off the ground, but I, within my own constraints, I personally, as a manager, try to do that, where I will just say at the beginning of each year, how do you, how do you want to be assessed? You know, how often, what cadence do you want to meet? What do you need from me to be effective? And then we just, we have, and it's not even a formal meeting most of the time. It's a, it's a quick check in. It's mm-hmm. almost like, hey, let's check in. Mm-hmm. Let's make sure we're still aligned. And if everything's fine, great. If I see a tear forming or some kind of emotional situation happening, or if I can just catch a hint of, hey, I'm kind of lost, then maybe we'll sit down for a few minutes. But I'm very interested in how people want to be treated and then trying to treat them in a way that's also congruent with corporate goals and aligned with our legal and HR practices. But that's hard. Yeah, It's a very hard uh, step to take. But I, I think that's where this space is probably going. The only way to treat them fairly is to find out how they want to be treated and then make sure it's congruent with the rest of the the organization, right? I think so. And I think human resources can be a strategic partner in that process and absolutely need to be strategic and involved. But that's also a very progressive stance. And so what do you think are some of the blockers to taking that kind of position on performance assessments and compensation and evaluations? And I'm trying to think of the way to put it. This is an this is a fringe kind of idea, I think, at this point in management theory, and in the way that um, even HR professionals think. So, what does it take to basically go to your your VP of HR and say, "Hey, perhaps what we're doing isn't working. Can we just ask the team uh, how they want to be assessed and, and try try to pull some pieces from there?" Or is that a conversation that you probably can't have today? I think it absolutely should. It's a conversation that should happen. And I think sometimes it does. Yep. You know, I mean, I have certainly, I certainly have friends who have gone to their um, HR person and said, look, I've worked really hard to get this team functioning well, and I've been working at it all year. And I'm worried that, you know, if I do an annual individual performance and everybody gets, you know, this two point you know, point something or other difference in their salary that it's going to get in the way of teamwork and it's going to destroy the work I've done all year. And every single person that I've talked to who has had that conversation with HR, uh, with their HR representative, um, the HR representative has said, right on, you know, I, I totally get what you're talking about. Let's see what we can do to work with that. I think that a lot of our systems have grown up, including HR systems, out of a notion 
that, you know, the mechanistic mindset about we design the perfect machine and the widgets, if we get the right widgets, everything will all be wonderful. It doesn't really account for the individual variation and individual feelings and so forth. But my experience when I've talked to people that have had those conversations is that HR has been very supportive of them. Because in some, in some ways, they're, they're, you know, in the same system we are, right? Right. Right. And I think I think agile um, is one of the first things that has been so team centric and so much in favor of self organization that um, it's it, it is kind of bumping up against those systems in many places. And I think systems change can be difficult to navigate. Mm-hmm. And so the but I'm very excited about the conversations that are happening happening, and I think we're moving this conversation in the right direction. And I think Agile is a great place to have that happen because of the focus on high-functioning teams. I think, too, it's going to be a generational thing because I I know that there are um, pockets of management that do want to pick winners and losers. And they see that as some kind of influence or authority or or perk of the gig. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that thinking, I think, has to go away. And until it does, I think we're going to struggle with this, this fair treatment and more effective means of, of assessing people. Or is that an unfair statement? Have I, have I treated managers badly? Well, here's, here's the thing. I don't think that the majority of people who are managers would say, oh, I'm going to pick my favorite kid. But there's something about the system of management and the origins of the system of management, which you know, comes from separation of head and hands. Um, right. You know, we are the people who do all the thinking and you just do the work as we tell you. And th- that um, that mindset is very entrenched, but not at a conscious level. Right. So, uh, you know, people people who are, you know, pretty well adjusted human beings walk into that system, put on that um, mantle. And a lot of those things unconsciously become part of how things are acted. So I think on some level it is generational, although I have a friend who said, well, we're just going to have to wait for the current generation of managers to die out. But <laughs> I don't mean it like that. I think, Esther, you cleaned up my comment quite a bit that um, it is a, a factory mindset yeah. that is prevalent in a lot of our subconscious yeah. uh, thought. But we're now knowledge workers. Yeah. And, and knowledge work is is a different beast. And uh, a good friend of the show, and I think a good friend of ours is Tim Ottinger, mm-hmm. He does a, a talk about the 11 twelfths where, you know, if a, if a programmer were to um, program for an entire day and then forget to check in their work, system crashes, but they had a printout of all the code they generated that day, how long would it take them to just type that back in and get it checked into Subversion or Git or one of the, the many code repositories? And the, typically when he asks that question in a workshop, and he shared this on the show, so I don't mind giving away his punchline, but uh, it's about 30, 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes to get it back into the system. Well, that gives managers pause. Well, wait a minute. That's eight hours worth of work that took you 30 to 45 minutes to type. And why it, didn't you do it in 30 minutes the first time? Exactly. And that's, <laughs> it's one of those insightful moments that Tim creates quite often in his workshops where basically it says, look, we're not factory workers anymore. This is knowledge work. And people are working when they're doing the thinking. And it, it's such a huge distinction that it's one that that um, that, that caught me up for a while, and it uh, I think it's a hard um, a hard change to make. But I think you've you've cleaned up my thoughts very well in that it's really not I'm not wishing that the current uh, you know group of managers move on and retire and hit Florida and and enjoy enjoy the the retirement life. I'm I'm more thinking that it's that that manufacturing type mindset or that factory work mindset that just has to get out of our, our thinking because we're no longer just building widgets. We're, we're manipulating ones and zeros and that's a totally different thing. Right. I think it, it's not as with your, the area and agile with working with really intelligent, high performing individuals, it just, it no longer fits like the old way of doing performance management. It's not relevant it's not strengths-based, it's not constructive, you, you know, it's not timely, whereas that's what we need right now working with Agile teams. 
Well, and I've worked in the manufacturing space. And so medical device is a, it's a very interesting field. There's a lot of knowledge work behind it. But at the shop floor level, they have the plans and they know what they're building. So they run the machines and people are evaluated on you know, the number of, of parts they create over a shift, the number of defects or scrap that they create. You know, there are very quantifiable metrics that make a lot of sense to show a skill level in following a process. And if only software development were like that, these systems of, and processes of, of evaluating people would make total sense. But it's not. It's what is scrap or waste on one project is, yeah. is the, the key piece in another. Yeah. Well, I, I actually um, think people working on the factory floor would like to be treated with a little more respect and dignity than that as well. I, I, I totally agree. <laughs> um, but it, it, one of the things that I find sort of encouraging is that, um, you know, everybody talks about millennials needing feedback and wanting meaningful work, which, I mean, to me, that just seems like sort of normal human. But I, I think that the millennials aren't going to put up with it and that at a certain point, companies are going to have to say, you know, if we want the we want really bright talented young people coming into our organizations, we're going to have to change our organization so that they're attractive to those bright, talented young people. And then everyone benefits. Everyone benefits. Because everybody wants feedback in yeah. a positive, constructive way. Right. Everyone wants to feel like what they're doing is valued and that it matters and yeah. that they see the bigger picture of how, what they do, how that fits into the bigger picture. You know, it's interesting, the, the, the millennial comment, because I, I totally agree. And from a managing perspective, we've se I've seen this. We would bring in a, a candidate that's in that, that age range, some of the, for a, a very, you know, very good paying job, a uh, lot of challenging work. But we've actually seen candidates in that millennial age range say, no, I don't want to work here. The building is too depressing. And it's not, it doesn't feel like the kind of space where I would be effective. And for some, some other people, and for some people that are not necessarily grounded in some of the, that kind of thinking, that's a mind-blowing statement. Mm -hmm. It's like, we've offered you a great compensation package for the area. It's well above market. It's challenging work. But the person felt that, you know, from a, an emotional, psychological state, that a, a drab corporate building would not be the right environment for, for him or her. And I, we're starting to see more of that as, as this group of... Um, candidates yeah. or just as this group of people uh, come in and, and interview and we're seeing answers like that that are just I don't want to say confusing but stunning yeah well it, uh, I think it goes right back to that Lewin formula the behavior or performance is a function of the person and the environment and to right. separate those two is to you know by definition create an unfair evaluation and it's great that people are noticing that, that, you know, this is not an environment where I could be successful. So, Stacy, as a manager, this might be a selfish question, but what are things that I can do as a manager and what are things that other managers can do to improve their thinking in this space to, and to be a better partner uh, with their HR counterparts, with their HR teams? Well, I think it, from listening to you, it sounds like you're really on board with this and you know, identifying your, the individuals that you work with as intelligent people that want to be there. Like most people want to be at work because it's engaging and it's fun. And, you know, on your agile teams, people have that intrinsic motivation. And, the, and for our managers is to tap into that and to make sure that there's space for that creativity and space for people to do their best work and space for them to use their strengths and that it is strengths based and that when there is conversations because of course conflict is inevitable it's going to happen with every team it's just it's impossible to work in an organization and not have some conflict so when it does happen that there's the ability to talk about it in a constructive manner that is kind of a feed forward concept so that you're looking at not oh what are all the mistakes of the past or what has been going wrong but okay, so that project didn't go perfectly, but how are we going to make improvements or how, you know, so it's looking into the future. So it's, uh, how are we improving? If that helps for managers to have that framework, that lens. 
I think that idea of a feed forward is a really important idea. So to build on what you said, Stacy, rather than look at what went, you know, what went wrong, let's let's understand what contributed in the environment, and then let's see what we can do to create an environment for success. Right? How can we create the space for people to be really successful? I agree, and that language is from Marcus Buckingham, who is yeah. Yeah, a prolific author, and the strengths based in and that feed forward concept is is from that. So I'm certainly not making that up. I'm drawing from from the research on in that area. So I think what will, what will be really exciting to people listening is that those conversations are happening in the HR world, mm-hmm. and that the that the realization that the ways that uh, people are currently assessed today, there's an acknowledgement that you know at fifty percent, fifty eight percent of people saying it doesn't work. I think is the stat that you gave us earlier, Stacy, is um, or it isn't effective. It isn't effective. I think that's an, a, an amazing statistic that's floating out there in the HR community that will have to be addressed at some point. So I think it's encouraging there. But it's also just encouraging that such ideas that, that the fact that asking the team about compensation and asking the team about assessments and how they want to be uh, assessed and that that's even a question or even a, a stance that we're, we could be allowed to take that there aren't barriers to it other than your own internal organizations and working through that process with your teams. And so that's encouraging as well. And I think at this point, I think that that's a great place for us to, to, to kind of frame this one out, uh, unless you guys have any final statements or comments about the many topics that we've, we've dove in and out of hmm. today. Oh, I think we could talk about this all day. <laughs> yeah, oh. I could. I think so too. So at this point in the podcast, uh, Esther and Stacy, we like to give the guests an opportunity to plug anything that they have going on coming up, any workshops, any classes, anything that you would like to promote or anything that you would like to uh, recommend to the audience uh, that you think they would find helpful or related to the topics we covered today. So Stacy, uh, why don't you go first if there's anything that you'd like uh, to plug or if anything, just how people could get a hold of you sure. if they want to continue the conversation and and uh, dig into some of these great ideas that you've you've laid on the table for us. Well, thank you very much for having me on the show. This topic is near and dear to my heart, and it, it, and it is a really exciting topic. And people can find me at audacityhr.com. Esther, are you still traveling the world with Don, or have you got? <laughs> oh. Don is in India right now. Oh my! Yes, um, but Don and I are going to be doing our Coaching Beyond the Team workshop in Malmo. Um, oh, wow. Coming up in May, the um, it's a Tuesday and Wednesday. I think it's the tenth and eleventh, and we could probably fit one or two more people in the workshop. Um, so, coachingbeyondtheteam dot com will tell you the information about that. Other than that, you know, I'm continuing to do my free um, Q and A's on roughly a monthly basis. So, if people would like to sign up for those, there's a space on my website to do that. I'm just finishing up my series on the six rules for change and um, taking suggestions for what my next series should be. Very good. And I think you're also um, speaking at Agile 2016 this year, right? I am. I am. Actually, my next talk is going to be at the Big Apple Scrum Scrum Days coming up May Great. in May. Um, but yes, I'm going to be talking at Agile 2016. I have two talks. Um, one is about coaching teams and the other is leaders at all levels. Very good. Super excited about those. Well, thank you very much for the sharing all those things. We'll make sure to get all of those events in the show notes so that people can be sure to uh, check out what you have going on. And we might send you a couple book recommendations too, right, Stacy? Right. Yeah, Excellent. I will. What's interesting about the Agile community, we all have far too many books, but uh, we love them dearly. Yeah. So take any book recommendations that you have. And by the way, folks, if you have not read Esther's books, amazing. And we'll get some links out to those as well. Those are uh, great reading for uh, managers and in any kind of team, Agile or not. But uh, we'll make sure we get Esther's books linked in the show notes as well. They've certainly been influential on on my career. So can I mention one book right now? Since we, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, since we talked about managers needing and team members needing the skill to actually offer feedback, I would recommend a little book by Jerry Weinberg and um, Charlie and Edie Seashore uh, called What Did You Say? The Art of Giving and Receiving Feedback. 
I have that one on the shelf behind me, and that is it's, excellent. It is a it's a good little book on how to offer that sort of how how to have that kind of conversation, and what can go wrong, and what the psychology of it is. Yep, I'll make sure to get that in the sure. show notes, and then any other books that you guys send over, I'd be happy to uh, to link back to. Okay. And I'm your host Ryan Ripley. As far as plugs go, um, I'm speaking at Path to Agility uh, next month, May in Columbus, Ohio. So if you want to come out and say hi, I'll be there. We're also podcasting during that event. So we'll be recording some shows with uh, many of the speakers, uh, attendees. So if you've ever wanted to be on a podcast and have never been able to do it, join us in Columbus and we'd be happy to, uh, to have you on the show. I'll also be speaking at Agile 2016 in, uh, in Atlanta this year. So made it into the big conference. Very excited about that. I don't, f- and I think I'm actually scheduled opposite Esther this year. Oh. So. So that's a bummer. I, I, I'll miss one of her talks, but I'll get to see the other. But um, definitely going to be a great time out in Atlanta. We'll uh, try to do a meetup of some sort for the podcast. And, and again, if you want to meet or say hi, more than happy to do that. At Ryan Ripley on Twitter. And uh, please leave us your comments in the show notes. And as always, thank you for being here and have a great night. Thanks for listening to Agile for Humans. Let's keep the conversation going. Drop us a question on Twitter at Agile for Humans or visit agileforhumans.com.